I'm going to show two work examples of flux problems, the flux of a vector field through a surface. The first one is a vector field that's, whose components are x, y, and z to the fourth. And uh, the surface is the part of the cone z equals root x squared plus y squared. Well, we can also write that as z equals r, which is very helpful. That's where that's, that's the polar and cylindrical r, not, uh, not rho, not the distance to the origin in three dimensions. It's the part of the cone beneath z equals 1 with the downward orientation. So let's sketch that. Got to have some sort of picture in these things. So it's the part of the cone that's below the plane. Uh, notice it's just the cone part. It's not the closed surface, which would be the cone plus the the, the disk on top that's in the plane z equals 1. Uh, that's going to be uh, more interesting for something like the divergence theorem, where we, when we use a closed surface. Right now we're just talking about the, just the cone. And the orientation, the normal vector we're using, is downward, and then, of course, outward as well. So um, we want to look at this and see which of the two methods we, we can use. Is it true that this vector field is either everywhere tangent to the surface, in which case the flux is just 0 and we're done, or everywhere perpendicular to the surface? Well, if you just test a point, for example, uh, like if you set x equals 1, y equals 0, and therefore z equals 1 not to be on this cone coming out above the x-axis, then you're getting 1, 0, 1. Well, that's something that is going tangent to the cone. So at some point, it's tangent. So it's definitely not everywhere perpendicular. And But if we pick something else, then the z to the fourth is going to mess us up. Uh, for example, if you have like one, x equals 1 half and y equals 0, then z is just going to be x is 1 half, then f is going to be 1 half, 0, 1 sixteenth. And if you draw that in, if you think about it a little bit, that's not going to be either par parallel or perpendicular to the cone. This just isn't, there isn't not a special relationship here. So we are going to have to parameterize. And how do we want to parameterize this? Well, we want to take advantage of the symmetry. This is radially symmetric. We don't want to just use a graph parameterization. Even though this is a graph, z is a function of x and y, it wouldn't be a good idea to just use a graph parameterization. If we did, we'd end up getting an ugly integral that we'd want to convert to polar at anyway. So let's use r and theta. Let's do that first and be smart about using the right variables from the start. So there's our parameters. And I just need to know z, x, and y as functions of r and theta. Well, x is just going to be r cosine theta. y is r sine theta. And then we use the fact that z is the square root of x squared plus y squared. Oh, hey, wait, z equals r. So that was a big clue that r is going to be a good parameter, because it is actually happens to be the same as z for this surface. And then that's not at all unpleasant. That's just polar. So now we've got to uh, look at the partial derivative vectors, r sub <laughs> r sub r, that's kind of a weird one. That's the what happens if we draw the grid. So the grid we've got now is like a pretty natural grid with lines coming up and out and lines going around for the when, when theta varies. And what happens with r sub r, remember that's just dx dr dy dr dz dr. It's going to be one of the ve tangent vectors to the surface that we're going to use to create the ds eventually. And so that's going to be cos theta um, sine theta comma 1. And r theta is dx d theta dy d theta dz d theta. And that's going to be minus r sine theta r cosine theta z, uh, 0. Yep, because at 0, because as theta varies, you go around a circle, and those circles have constant height. So uh, now we need to take the cross product. And put that in. And we can be pretty sure 
since this is a nice surface and a nice parameterization, we'd be pretty sure that we're going to get a cos squared plus sine squared in here somewhere. And okay, so I, that dies, and we get a minus r cos theta i. And then secret minus sine, that dies again. Okay, so the secret minus sine is already in there. Then there's a minus from the fact that we're doing the minus b uh, d part, by minus b c part. And there's another minus from this guy. So that ends up being three minus signs, which is a minus. And then k is where we're going to get the cosine squared plus sine squared. Cosine squared times r plus sine squared times r. And so we just get r k. And I want to rewrite that. There's a common factor of r here. Well, we could rewrite it this way, actually. Oh, it's getting a little far down. That's going to be uh, somewhat useful, but we could also rewrite it. Let me just put it over here. We want this all in terms of r and, r and theta because of the we want the parameterization. But whenever we see r cosine theta, we can say you know that's minus x i minus y j plus r k. That's a pretty simple formula, and we can make sure that that makes sense by looking back at the picture. If we look at something coming up like above the x-axis, where x is positive, y is zero, and and r is equal to x, it says we're going to go down in the i direction, da uh, we're going to go, sorry, we're going to go in in the i direction. Okay, so that's back away from the, from us, because remember that's the way the x-axis goes. So it's going to go back, and this is zero, and this is positive, so it's going to go back and up. Ah, now that's really important information, because that's telling us that's actually upward. If we just look at here, that, that's a positive, r is positive, so that's r times k. That's going to be the upward orientation. Okay. All that means is that we happen to do r r r cross r theta in that order. It's just giving the minus of what we want. So we're just gonna we're just gonna fix that. Um, we can fix it at the end if we want, or we could fix it now. So um, the other thing we can look at is the k part of that. How much that vector goes up doesn't depend at all on x and y. It's just r, and that's good because this the the normal vector should go up or down, whichever one you use, the same amount. Um, if I go around, it should be all symmetrical. It shouldn't have a function of theta in there. Okay, so we're going to look at, we're going to use minus that guy because that's going to be downward. So that's, remember, that's a finicky thing that we have to worry about sometimes. Well, we always have to worry about it. Sometimes we have to do the minus sign. So now we're almost ready. The integral, the double integral over s of f dot ds is the integral, and we're going to take that function, let me just write it, x, y, z to the 4. This is the only place, that this is the first place that that's come in, where the vector field has come in. When you're looking at this stuff and you're parameterizing the surface, don't get confused with the vector field. That's different information. That's going to come in in its own separate way. That does not have anything to do with parameterizing the surface and the r, 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 theta, all that kind of stuff. So dotted with, and let me just write it out. So now I'm going to Right, it's r theta cross r r because now we realize that's really what we want, and so it's always the theta tangent or one of the tangents r u or r theta, whatever we want to call it, cross the other tangent which we just calculated, d d u d v or d r d theta, whatever the parameters are. Oh, and now I can put in the limits, and now of course that's the big payoff. It's part of the big payoff for using polar, is that what are the r's and thetas that actually matter? Well. It's basically the r's and thetas that describe the right x's and y's in the shadow of this surface. That's just how you parameterize the how you describe the unit circle in polar. Okay. Now here's a really easy mistake to make. You might think that I need an r d r d theta here. Wait a minute. I thought we always had to have r d r d theta. The r in r d r d theta was a Jacobian factor. That's exactly a special case of this kind of calculation. The r theta cross r r the magnitude of that includes the stretching or shrinking factor, the, the area distortion factor. That includes the R. There's nothing special. It just ha if, if I'd call these du, dv, and ignored the fact that we've already seen them before in another context, it'd be a little less confusing, probably, because you wouldn't be tempted to put an artificial R in here. But the R is already present in there. 
I'll continue it in the next video and finish it.